Hi friends, Father Kerry Walters here, pastor of Holy Spirit American National Catholic Church. And this is another Holy Spirit moment, this one on the erotic mysticism of Marjorie Kemp. In previous Holy Spirit moments, I have discussed the remarkable flourishing of Christian mysticism in 14th century England. And we've looked at its four primary representatives, Richard Roll, Walter Hilton, Dame Julian of Norwich, and the anonymous author of The Cloud of Unknowing. Today, I would like to introduce you to a fifth English mystic of the 14th century, Marjorie Kemp. Some people will deny that she is a genuine mystic because her writings are so out of the ordinary, but I believe that she richly deserves the label, and I'll try to explain why. The reason I think that Marjorie Kemp is somehow exiled from the family of Christian mystics is because the visions that she claims to have had are intensely erotic. They are intensely sexual, as a matter of fact, and they can set the teeth on edge of a person who is thinking about mysticism as a more ascetic kind of enterprise. But in truth, Eroticism in at least one strain of Christian mysticism has a long lineage going all the way back to the Hebrew Bible's Song of Songs, in which the author can find no better metaphor for expressing the soul's yearning for God than the metaphor of eroticism, of physical love. You may recall that the opening line of the Song of Songs is the beautiful, Oh, that thou would kiss me with the kisses of thy mouth, the soul speaking to God, the lover speaking to the beloved. And this emphasis upon eroticism in the relationship with God will run right through uh, the Middle Ages. We see it expressed, for example, in an ascetic cloistered monk like Bernard of Clairvaux, who writes sermon after sermon on the Song of Songs. We see it expressed in the writings of the lowland uh, Christian mystics uh, known as the Beguines. We see it in Bridget of Sweden. We see a bit of it in Richard Roll, as a matter of fact, when he speaks about the fire of love, the heat of love for God, and we certainly find it in Marjorie Kemp. Marjorie Kemp writes about her visions, or I should say dictates her visions. She appears to have been illiterate. Toward the end of her life, she dies sometime after 1439. We're not quite sure when. The book was all but forgotten a century after her death. And thank goodness it was discovered in the early 1930s in a squire's country house uh, in northern England while people were looking for ping pong balls. The manuscript was chucked away in a shelf um, and was all but destroyed until someone wisely thought about sending it to the British Museum. In this particular book, which Marjorie dictated, she tells us about her life with an incredible kind of honesty. Marjorie was uh, born into a relatively uh, wealthy uh, merchant family in Norfolk in 1373. When she was 20, she marries a relatively prosperous merchant named John Kemp. They will eventually have 14 children together. Uh, she becomes pregnant very early on in the marriage, and it appears to have been a hard pregnancy and a hard labor. And it was exacerbated by the feeling, as Marjorie writes, that she had a sin which she couldn't bring herself to confess. Almost certainly the sin was sexual in nature. And after the delivery of her first child, she falls into what might be a postpartum depression that lasts about eight or nine months. And it's only relieved when she has her first vision of the Lord. Jesus appears to her and says, Marjorie, why have you forsaken me? That is, why have you allowed yourself to fall into this dark hole of despair? I've never forsaken you. And that vision seems to snap Marjorie out of her depression. And for the next 20 years, she lives a relatively conventional life as a businesswoman, as a, as a wife, and as a mother. But when she's in her 40th year, she has a second vision. This time it's an auditory vision. She hears, she tells us in the book, the sweet melody, the sweet music of heaven. And she asks herself, why in the world would anyone do anything in this life to jeopardize their ability to hear this sweet music for all of eternity in heaven? That's the beginning, as it were, of her conversion, of her realization that what she truly does yearn for is deeper and deeper and deeper intimacy with God. But 
Marjorie is apparently a very sexual person. Um, she clearly enjoys sex with her husband, even though in the book at several places she protests that she doesn't. She lusts after a, another man while she is still married to John, who eventually rebuffs her, uh, breaking her heart and wounding her pride. Uh, she asks John several times if they can enter into a chaste relationship. Uh, he, of course, refuses each time. And it's pretty clear, if you read the document carefully, that Marjorie is ambivalent about entering into that kind of a relationship herself because she is such a sexually charged person. Eventually, however, they do agree to lead a chaste life. And it seems to be that at that point, Marjorie begins to sublimate her sexual desires and channel them more and more into her yearning for God. In the meantime, she is having vision after vision after vision, and all of these visions are very concrete. They're almost cinematic, and they're almost tactile. She has visions, for example, of being with Mary, the mother of Jesus, um, and of helping Mary nurture the baby Jesus, or of running errands and doing chores for Mary. She accompanies Mary to Golgotha as Mary watches in despair her son die on the cross. Her visions of Jesus are likewise very cinematic and very tactile. Jesus ravishes her with his presence. She follows Jesus across uh, the Holy Land as he preaches and ministers to others. It is almost as if Marjorie is practicing what's known as Ignatian meditation two centuries before Ignatius. Ignatius meditation, of course, is when we read scripture and try to enter into the story that we're reading, not just be outside spectators of it. The difference, however, is that that kind of meditation is an act of the will on our parts. Marjorie wouldn't have said that her visions are acts of the will. They are infused into her by God's grace. Her yearning for God becomes so intense, the sublimated eroticism, the sublimated sexuality becomes um, such a powerful force in her life and such a powerful um, connection between her and God that it culminates in an extraordinary way in her marriage with the Godhead. Now, it's certainly the case that other mystics in this erotic strain of mysticism have talked about being brides of Christ or entering into marriages with Christ. And of course, all cloistered nuns are brides of Christ, aren't they? Simply by virtue of their vows. But Marjorie's understanding of what happens with her and God is quite extraordinary because it's not Jesus with whom she enters into marriage. It is the Godhead. It is God the Father. It is the first person of the Trinity. Let me read you a bit of what Marjorie has to say about this marriage. You'll find her description of it in chapters 35 and 36 of her book, uh, uh, of her autobiography, which is usually just called The Book of Marjorie Kemp. This is what she writes. And by the way, I should tell you, she refers to herself throughout the book as this creature or the creature. The father said to this creature, daughter, I will have you married to my Godhead because I shall show you my secrets and my schemes for you shall dwell with me without end. I will show you everything. I will enter into this act of incredible intimacy with you. The Godhead tells Marjorie, and that immediately frightens her, and she explains why. Then the creature kept silent in her soul and did not answer this, for she was so dreadfully afraid of the Godhead, and she had no knowledge of conversation with the Godhead, as all of her love and all of her affection was placed in Christ's manhood. She's been having these intensely concrete, uh, tactile visions of Christ for most of her life. And then suddenly, God the Father, this unapproachable being, proposes marriage to her. Well, she balks, but God the Father simply will not relent. And as it were, he proposes again on one knee, and she finally does agree. And when they exchange vows the entire heavenly host and all of the saints and all of the angels are witnesses. And the marriage vows are very conventional. God says to Marjorie, I take you, Marjorie, to be my wedded wife, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, so that you dutifully and submissively do what I ask of you. And as soon as the vows are taken, all kinds of extraordinary experiences assail Marjorie. 
She smells sweet aromas. The atmosphere is suffused with them. And what she takes initially as dust motes all around her in the sunshine, God explains, are really angels cavorting in joy around her. And she feels these intense heat flashes pulsing through her entire body, and they frighten her until God explains to her that they are simply manifestations of his passion for her and her passion for him, the passion that a husband and a wife feel for one another. And then the Godhead says something really quite extraordinary to her. I'm quoting again. If I was physically on earth as I was before I died on the cross, God says, I shall not be ashamed of you, for I should take you by the hand. It is appropriate that the wife is intimate with her husband. Be he ever such an important Lord and she just a poor woman when he married her. Yet they must sleep together and rest together in joy and peace. Therefore, I must be intimate with you, Marjorie, and lie in your bed with you. And therefore, you may boldly take me in your soul's arms and kiss my mouth, my head, and my feet as sweetly as you wish. Extraordinary, isn't it? That the Godhead suddenly in Marjorie's vision becomes something which is kissable, which is strokeable, which will lie in her bed, in her marriage bed, in her bridal bed with her, which will share intimate secrets with her, pillow talk, if you will, between the mystic and the God for whom the mystic yearns. Erotic mysticism takes seriously what it means to yearn for God. What do we mean by erotic or eroticism? I know that in our day and age, we tend to use the word erotic as a synonym for sexual, don't we? And certainly there's a highly charged sexual element in eroticism. But eroticism, properly speaking, is simply a yearning that incorporates the entire person. When we erotically long for the beloved, our mind, our body, our reason, our passions are all implicated. What we do when we erotically yearn is to become so united with the beloved that our identity and the beloved's identity merge with one another. No less a person than the 20th century novelist D.H. Lawrence, who was not by any uh, shape or form a Christian, took seriously this understanding of eroticism. Lawrence argued that whenever we have sexual orgasms, we are experiencing a kind of mystical experience because in that moment, the identity of the two lovers tends to disappear and they unite with one another. This is the kind of yearning that Marjorie Kemp had for God. And so it seems perfectly appropriate in her case just as it was with the author of the Song of Songs so many centuries earlier, to speak of this yearning in erotic terms. Mar Marjorie Kemp lies in the same bed with the God whom she adores. What better expression of mystical union could one possibly ask for? My friends, I really do urge you to pick up a copy of the book of Marjorie Kemp and read it. You will find it at times uh, humorous. You will t find it at times probably a bit annoying or irritating, but you will find throughout one of the most remarkable confessions of love for God that you are likely to run across. I'm Father Kerry Walters, and this has been another Holy Spirit moment. Thank you so much for watching. I urge you to subscribe if you feel so inclined. Take care. God bless. I'll see you soon.